Issue 70 The story opens up with some narration above an explosion, and right away I'm calling bullshit because it really expects me to believe that Mobius was once a virtual paradise until Robotnik conquered it. The sheer fact that there were wars, like the war with the Overlanders that got Robotnik into power in the first place, means that it wasn't a paradise. They really, really needed the word virtual there, but it still wasn't enough. We then see Sonic thinking that he barely had enough time to throw away the grenade thrown at him from last time, and I finally get the pun about the sergeant being a gorilla explained to me. Just goes to show you how the most clever puns are the ones you don't even notice at all. After Sonic asks if everyone was okay, showing compassion, we see the opposite of compassion as the wife of the racist panda bear only cares about what the criminals did to her juice bar, saying, who cares what they do to him? And after Sonic tries to reason with her that he was kidnapped for being a scientist, she showed utter apathy once again, saying, tell it to the secret service. Good thing Sonic can keep his temper under control because I would have wanted to deck her for that. After they decide to warn the king, Jeffrey gives the king the mistaken conclusion that the escaped prisoners had perished in the area's boiling oceans, and is promptly shown to be wrong by Sonic. Jeffrey goes into denial over this because he doesn't want to believe that he was wrong, although Sonic at least acknowledges the idea that the criminals could have been shapeshifters or evil doubles or clones, which makes sense considering all the doubles that he's seen by this point. He's being genre savvy. The king then decides to side with Jeffrey, even though Sonic knew what he saw, and asks how the prisoners could have made it back to Mobotropolis in such a record time. That's an ironic line because I kept saying that I was expecting them to make it back there a lot sooner, and kept getting surprised by Sonic super specials that weren't about them invading the city. Then Dr. Quack comes to the rescue, telling them that the starving guards have regained the strength enough to inform him of a third missing shuttlecraft. I like how Sonic says numero uno question. It makes sense for his character to talk informally that way, by randomly switching to a different language. Elias says that he has a map of the planet at his disposal, at the very least, and wonders if the prisoners fled to the landmass closest to the Devil's Island. I like how he says stuff like, it may be a long shot, and perhaps, showing that rather than being prideful, he has humility, something I never would have expected of him before meeting him. I always expected him to be a snob. Unfortunately, the king is immediately a worthless, obstructive bureaucrat by inexplicably forbidding the Freedom Fighters from doing their actual jobs, being a genre-blind idiot who actually thinks that his secret service will be allowed by the plot to arrest the Renegade successfully. How stupid are you? Do you really not know how it works in this universe? Especially since on the one real mission Jeffrey and his elites went through, Jeffrey was the only one who did anything, and could have solved the mission himself. In fact, anyone could have solved the mission themselves. All the mission involved was walking through snow until they randomly bumped into Elias. This is going to be the first in a long line of obstructive bureaucrats thinking they have the right to betray the Freedom Fighters by getting in their way. And believe me, it's going to get a lot worse for Sally later on. At the very least, he does explain himself that the Kingdom no longer expects children to take up arms against enemies. The Freedom Fighters were child soldiers. But then he goes on to say that Jeffrey will take care of it, even though he must have been at least 18 to have dated Sally without any awkwardness about it. So he's just as much of a child as Sonic is. And Jeffrey doesn't have any special powers. If he thinks he's more competent than Sonic, he's delusional. I mean, let's, let's consider this for a minute. You have Jeffrey, a normal person with no special powers whatsoever, and then you have someone who can run at the speed of sound, effortlessly spin dash through any robot with his spines, and just pretty much create tornadoes whenever he wants to defeat any enemy effortlessly. And somehow, Jeffrey is chosen over him. I like how Sonic and Sally are just as indignant about this obstructive bureaucrat bullshit in a Sonic comic as I am. Sally's like, Daddy, you can't be serious! And Sonic reminds him that he's fought creeps like that for years. Well, at least the king is able to use logic to defend his position again by saying, then how did they manage to get the jump on you earlier? And he says that it pains him to say it, at least, so it's like his conscience is telling him that he's making a mistake. But still, disbanding the Freedom Fighters when they're the Kingdom's obvious only hope is the stupidest thing he's ever done, and he's delusional if he thinks it'll work out and be accepted. Most genre-blind person ever. And we don't even get to see the Freedom Fighters react right away to this bullshit, it just cuts away. I figured I'd start to hate the King eventually, 
Just because he's the king doesn't mean he has the right, or especially not the know-how, to deserve to order the freedom fighters around, when he just sits in his chair with no actual experience fighting Eggman. No one who's a bystander like that has any business ordering the heroes around. That's what Sally's for. If Sally's not even allowed to be the leader, the one thing she's in the team and in the comic for, then why even have her there? Isn't it bad enough that Elias took away her position as the heir to the throne? Now she's got nothing! We then cut to a royal submarine many hours later emerging from the coast of Big Kahuna Island. So let's see how Jeffrey gets humiliated. He explains to his elite that Robotnik had been using West Robotropolis as a testing ground for his secret experiments, so it only makes sense that, sadly, he's not allowed to finish that thought, because I immediately smile at seeing Sonic show up and taunt him. What took you so long? Ha! Sonic, the hero of the world, doesn't have any business being here? Please. Good, Jeffrey decides to humor him. He says that he's gonna have to learn to be a team player if he wants to help them on their mission. And Sonic has a great sarcastic combat. Well, you know, there were a lot of reasons why we called ourselves the Freedom Fighters, St. John. But mainly it's because there was more than one of us. Yeah, I don't know where Jeffrey got the idea that a guy who was already part of a team for years wasn't a team player. Sonic notices hearing a weird sound, which for some reason nobody else heard even though they're all right next to him. I guess hedgehogs have way better hearing? Instead, Hershey just tells him that everyone spotted something up ahead, which Sonic somehow hasn't spotted, even though he was with them. Jeffrey orders Snively's hideout to be surrounded, and Sonic calls him out on it, saying that what happened to the element of surprise? Telling him that Nate will just go from kidnapped victim to hostage. Jeffrey then shows racism against the Overlanders. Sadly, Sonic doesn't immediately punch him for that. Although, since he already showed racism against Robins with his paranoia towards Uncle Chuck, and he is paranoid, and that naturally leads to racism, I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. Sonic tells him that he shouldn't blame Nate for the Great War, saying, I don't even know what a Great War is, you doofus! Before they could get into a fight, the fight is broken up by, Whoa, who the hell is this cyborg? Is he, or is he wearing a weird helmet? Oh, that's Elias. Why didn't they ask why he came along? I mean, do you think that they... I mean, he's not part of Jeffrey's elites. Why aren't they confused? Why didn't they point him out earlier? But yeah, that's Elias. Yay, he wanted to be useful. He actually came along the mission. I'm really excited now. Bomb then jumps in trying to blow up near the criminals. Unfortunately, he didn't because wouldn't that blow up Nate too? Either way, Sonic and the Jeffrey elites charged because Sonic couldn't think of a plan that actually wouldn't blow up the element of surprise and another targeting satellite gets turned on in outer space. I like how during the fight with Kodos, with Sonic running around him in a circle, attacking him at Sonic speed multiple times, Nate is enthusiastically getting into it by saying, Atta boy, Sonic, let him have it! It's always nice to see him positive, because he seems so depressed before coming back to the city. With Kodos humiliated and defeated, Sonic lets Nate out of the contraption as we see Drago hilariously being scared of his ex-girlfriend in the background, going, WATCH THE FACE! That actually made me giggle. Unfortunately, an earthquake happens, which was caused by a giant squid rising out from under the floor of the old cart house and grabbing Snively, Trader Dog Sleuth, and Bomb because he probably assumes he's with them. Fortunately, rather than this being a complete Deus Ex Machina, it's at least explained what this guy is. A robotic, multi-limbed mutate, and we already know what mutates are, so it's not too out of nowhere. Since mutates came from magical days of fury, I can believe that he's robotic because they're just a part of the random spell that created him. After Sonic has a hero moment by inexplicably not wanting to abandon Snively to his fate, Bond blows up being perfectly fine afterwards because there's more than one of him, and Nate says, they're gone! And the next panel shows that Jeffrey and his elites are getting the cuffs on all of the criminals. Well, not all, since some of Snively's bunch had escaped in the confusion, including Snively himself. Elias is positive about the mission being a resounding success. I hope him being there will make the king go easier on Sonic for, god forbid, ensuring the success of the mission. How much of a fucking control freak would the king be if he punished Sonic for doing that just because he told him not to? Well, Sally did the exact same thing, actually, hitting Sonic with a stick and making him dizzy because he saved her from Eggman when she told him she could take care of herself, even though she desperately needed the help. 
So if the king does show a lot of gratitude, at least they'll be like father and daughter rather than coming completely out of nowhere. And after Sonic says he wants to send Crockbot's remains to the Devil's Gulag as well, which he should have done earlier, we end with what seems like Crockbot flying away with the biplane that his remains were stored in, while flying Moby and Criminal falls because I guess he blew into the plane's fire. Seriously though, Crockbot should have been so heavily destroyed that he wouldn't be able to fly the plane. They should have learned their lesson the first two times and made sure nothing was left of him. But they didn't. Although hopefully this will lead to an actually satisfying Crockbot villain fight this time. In the next story, we see Sonic having a nightmare about his biplane above Sandblast City disintegrating and him falling into the mouth of the Sonic statue he destroyed. Good, he's feeling guilty about destroying the security system generator of a city full of innocent people. So guilty that he's been having recurring nightmares about getting properly punished for doing that. So the comic acknowledges that he did an uncharacteristically villainous thing in his quest to get out of the city detaining of Mixus. Wait, the narration really expects me to believe Sonic thinks he's not the type to admire himself in the mirror? Sorry, that's not who Sonic is. The dream has Sonic being told that he's the hero of all heroes, to be celebrated by everything. Since when is Sonic humble? He's supposed to be agreeing with him. At least going, well, duh. Not doubting him. How the hell is there anyone more worthy of being called that than him? Why would Sonic be surprised that his adventures as a hero were chronicled by people? And why would he be reluctant to see them through the door? Granted, I don't want Sonic to be a cold jock douchebag color Sonic, but there's a... He still has to at least have arrogance as part of his character. I myself understand why someone would be creeped out by this, but I'm not arrogant like Sonic needs to be. And then we see Sonic being told that a bunch of scientists were also some of his biggest fans and have to spend hours discussing his adventures. And one of them nags Sonic about why Sally and him are together. Uh, they are. They have been since issue 50. What are you, behind in the issues? Sonic doesn't even point that out. Another one of the scientists says that he doesn't buy that Sally survived her fall, and she should have died as a martyr to the Freedom Fighter cause. A very heartless thing to say from an in-universe perspective. And it's not like he's reading comics from a different universe and believes that none of them actually happened. So why is he saying he doesn't buy it? It happened! This is too meta. Then Sonic wakes up from the dream people, telling him that because he's a hero he can do no wrong. He's terrified of actually believing that considering the guilt over ditching Sandblast City and not being punished for it that he confesses to Tails after this. And the story ends with Tails reassuring Sonic in a good friendship moment that's really short. The main story was written by Carl Bullard, and while it satisfyingly made up for the Freedom Fighter's easy loss by having Sonic humiliate Kodos and Drago's ex humiliating him as well, the Octopus kind of stole the definitive victory. Although it'd be underwhelming if all of the criminal fighting ended there, so it's good that some of the villains were able to get away. And I love that Elias came along on the mission. The big problem with this story was the King's declaration. Disbanding the Freedom Fighters is the stupidest, most genre-blind thing a character could possibly do. And what right do you have to do that? King or no king, you're still not a Freedom Fighter. Only the Freedom Fighters should have the right to run themselves, because what would some guy who sits on his ass all day instead of risking his life with them know about what's best for the Freedom Fighters? He shouldn't be usurping Sally's authority, it robs her of her only purpose. In the second story by Paul Castiglia, Paul Castiglia, at first I thought it was about Crockbot stealing the biplane since that's what the main story ended with, only to be a dream of songs about his guilt from what he did to Sandblast City. It's supposed to be all about showing what a true hero he is, but makes him come off as more of a Gary Stew. I mean, I don't think it's in character for Sonic at all to be this humble when they, that he would be uncomfortable with people praising him for his heroism instead of proud, and even saying that he doesn't admire himself in the mirror. What is that? If Sonic's not prideful, what is he? I like the guilt part, but the only way I'd accept the insecurity part is if it's true that it's only because he thinks he's unworthy because of his guilt and nothing else. Because I don't buy that he'd be this insecure normally. At least Tails and him had a good friendship moment at the end, but it was too short anyways. It is very good that we're told he feels guilty though, that really needed to be said. 